Hey everyone, uh, well, my name is Sam Hoke. Thank you, Pastor Tom. Uh, if you don't know me already, uh, yes, uh, I'm back uh, for a week here. I'm headed to college pretty soon here, but it's awesome to spend another week back at home with you guys. So honored. Thank you again, Pastor Tom, uh, for allowing me to come back uh, to speak. I'm really excited uh, for what we're going to talk about today. So I'm just going to jump right in uh, for interest of time. Uh, go ahead and throw that first slide up on the screen if we have that. I've got three people here for you. All right, Mother Teresa. Martin Luther King Jr., and this is the Apostle Paul, okay? I would just want you to think for yourself, why should these people go to heaven? All right, and if you were paying attention during the children's blessing, you might know where I'm going with this, but why should these people go to heaven? All right, so you might be thinking, all right, Mother Teresa, right, Nobel Peace Prize winner. She, she helped a ton of uh, orphans and the poor and so many who were oppressed. Like, of course, she's locked away, secured. Martin Luther King Jr., I mean, he was such an important voice during a time of serious, heavy racial tension. And I mean, the Apostle Paul, where do you start with him? He was foundational in the early churches. I mean, he wrote almost half of the New Testament. These are all people we would probably say are good people. They've done so much good in this world. But what this scripture re uh, reveals to us, the truth it exposes, is that good people, or maybe I should say good people, actually don't go to heaven, at least not because they're good. If you want the title of my message, if you're taking notes and want to write it down, here it is, rip up your resume. Rip up your resume. We're going to go back into the scripture and see what this means. We started in verse 4. I'm going to go back just a bit. We're going to go to verse 3 so we get some context here. Let's look at the word of the Lord this morning. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. Okay, so Paul here is saying that because we boast in Christ, we have no reason to be confident in our flesh. And real quick, the word flesh here, it can mean our sinful desires, our, our evil, sinful nature. But it can also just mean us, our bodies, ourselves, our works, our doings, right? The things we do in our flesh. That's all our flesh. And Paul is saying we have no reason to be confident in it. And here Paul's going to give us his resume. Okay, let's keep reading. If someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. Okay, so he lists two things here. He starts by listing his heritage, his background, things that were kind of out of his control. Right? And then he also lists things that were in his control. His works, his achievements, his kind of resume, right? And all these things are reasons for him to be confident in the flesh. But let's see what he says here in verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Now this Greek word garbage is translated kind of nice here, but Paul uses a much more vile word. It actually means vile excrement. Okay, so Paul is saying here that all your reasons to be confident in the flesh are complete and utter crap, honestly, for probably lack of a better term. He's saying that no matter why you might want to be confident in your flesh, it does not matter. So this reveals two truths. One, your heritage and your background do not affect your salvation. And your works, your achievements do not affect your salvation. Now this is a double-edged sword because for some of us in here, we have spent our whole lives working to be the best in our field. We, we've climbed the corporate ladder of America to, to be the best, to be the CEO, to get the fame, to get the wealth, to get the fortune, whatever it may be. And God says it doesn't matter. That can be really offensive to us, right? But this is also Amazing news for the one who's sitting in here who feels underqualified. The one who feels like their, their heritage or their background is unknown, or at least it's one they're not proud of. Uh, for the one who feels like no matter what you try to do, you screw it up, Paul says you can count it as loss. That's amazing news. And I mean, Paul can relate to that himself, right? Because remember, this is the same Paul who was persecuting Christians and literally murdering people in the church just a few years back. I'm sure he has a lot of shame, and yet he considers it loss for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of knowing Christ. 
But notice the words here. It's he considers them lost. Your version might say he counts them as lost, right? So this isn't to say that these things are inherently in and of themselves a loss, but rather that he started to view them this way, right? There's, there's been a perspective shift. A, a sort of paradigm has been changed in order for him to view this way. Right, so we're going to read further on about what, what changed in his life. Why, why has this happened? We're going to go back in verse 8 and read through to 11. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his, erection, of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Okay, so Paul has three desires here. Three desires. I'm going to give them all to you at the same time, and then we'll go through them one by one. His desires are to know Christ, to gain Christ, and to be found in Christ. To know Christ, to gain Christ, and to be found in Christ. Let's start with this first one, to know Christ, to know Christ. I think it's interesting that in here Paul says that everything is a loss just in comparison to knowing Christ, right? He doesn't say everything's a loss when I have the power of Christ or when I have the fame of Christ or when I have the Holy Spirit, whatever it is. He says just knowing who God is is enough for me. That's all it is. To know Christ, everything else is a loss, to have that mindset must be incredible, incredibly relieving. Oh, my greatest gift in life is to know you, to know you and to love you. Okay, we're going to read a passage from the book of Matthew that honestly might be a little tough for us, but we're not going to shy away from it today. We can throw this up on the screen. Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 through 23. This is Jesus talking. He says, many will say to me on that day, that's the final day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This messes with a lot of our theology, right? To say, hey, we, we were doing all these great things. We were casting out demons. We were prophesying all in your name. But what does he say? He doesn't say, you didn't attend enough church services. You didn't, you didn't give enough in the offering. You didn't cast out enough demons. He says, I didn't know you. I didn't know you. Away from me, you evildoers. So this, this brings up an interesting point. That means there is a difference between knowing of God and knowing God. There's a difference between knowing of God and knowing God. Maybe this illustration will help. So Morgan Freeman, amazing actor, right? Maybe even better narration voice. Uh, here's some cool things you might not know about him. So he was born on June 1st, uh, 1937. He stands at a nice six foot two. Um, he suffers from paralysis in his left hand, and he's actually an expert beekeeper. I don't know if you knew that. That's pretty cool. Expert beekeeping uh, as a side hobby. Now, if I told you that Morgan Freeman and I were best friends because of that information, you might look at me and be like, eh, okay, well, not only are you wrong, you're a little bit creepy, too, right? And you probably just Googled, 10 cool facts about Morgan Freeman to use in this sermon illustration. And if you're thinking that, you're exactly right. Yeah, of course, Morgan Freeman and I don't know each other. Um, but without me telling you a single fact, a single bit of information about Pastor Tom, you know that I know him. How does that make any sense? I haven't said a word about him. I haven't, I haven't showed you that I know him. How do you know that I know him? Why is that? Well, maybe it's because I can recognize him. I can show you who he is, right? I've spent time with him, but not only that, I've spent time with him in his house and with his family. My actions reflect his actions, and my mannerisms and habits are a little bit more like his. And maybe you even think that I sound a little bit more like him than maybe I did a few years back. Right now, I want us to go through these questions, or these things, rather, and ask ourselves, is this, my, is this what my relationship with Jesus looks like? Can you recognize him? Okay, maybe. Do you show others who he is? Do you spend time with him? I, may, I mean, maybe not as much as I should, but I mean, do you spend time with him in his house and with his family, right? 
All of us right here, are you spending time in his house and with his family? Do your actions reflect his actions? Are your habits and mannerisms similar to his? Do you sound a little bit more like him than maybe you did a few years back? Right? Is your language actually being transformed by the person of Jesus Christ? We spend time with God in order to know who God is. Okay? We spend time with him in order to know who he is. And Dude's Hill Church, with your permission, I would love to just tell you a little bit today about who my God is. Is it all right if I do that? Go ahead, just nod your head if we can do that. Awesome. Great. I would love to. And honestly, not everyone in here might agree with it, but that's okay. In fact, I hope that's the case because I would love to change one of your perspectives on who my God is. Hear me out, please. God is not a feeling. He's not a vibe. He's not the universe. Okay, God is a person. And like you and me, God has preferences. It is our job as Christians to find out what God likes and then get this, do them. Okay? We find out what he likes and what he does not like. Okay, so for me, for example, I don't like chocolate. I know. Weird. Come pray for me after service. I get it. It's weird. I don't like chocolate. I think it's a little gross. I, I know. I know. I'm sorry. But if my, if my uh, wife in the future, gosh, yeah, I'm sorry. If my wife in the future came to me and she said, hey, wedding anniversary, here you go. I got you a box of chocolate. I'd be like, you know what I would actually say? I would say, I don't like this. Do you even know me? Do you even know me? I thought, weren't we spending so much time together? Were you listening to me in that time we were spending together? Do you know me? Do you, do you even care about what I have to say? But often, here's, I think, the mindset that we sometimes have is we go to one church and we're like, oh, this Jesus is awesome. He tells me so much about what he likes about me and how much he loves me and that he cares and he's so proud of me. And then I'm doing life awesome. And he loves me so much. And then the second we hear any sort of message about a Jesus who says we need to change something in our lives or that we're doing something that he's not happy with, we're like, all right, I'm going to go right back to this Jesus. I like this one a little bit better. But you can't have half of Jesus and not have half of him. You are either getting all of him or you get none of him. Right? If you're picking and choosing what, the Bible, uh, what parts of the Bible to follow, or if you're picking and choosing which parts of Jesus to follow, you are not following the Bible. You're not following Jesus. Actually, you are following yourself. Why? Because you've made yourself the final authority. You've made yourself the final word. You can say, yeah, I love this book. The book has amazing information. I can read through it, but I don't, uh, I don't like this verse. This part's good, though. I really like this. I'll live like that. This part, I don't, I don't really agree with that. I don't think that's how it should be. You are God. You are God in that circumstance. That is not how we read the Bible. We read the Bible so that it changes our lives. It should dictate our lives. We do not dictate it. If you want transformation kind of power in your life, read the Bible to let it dictate your life. Because if you are God, then you have no power. You cannot transform your own life. And if you think you can, look back on the past however many years you have lived and see if your own power has transformed anything. Because chances are it hasn't. So there's got to be something wrong. We need to do something different. We need to do something different. Looking back at the verse with this all in mind, it says that we are supposed to attain the power of his resurrection. This is the part we all like. We're like, yeah, resurrection, amazing. And it also says participate in his sufferings. That's probably the part, if we could, at least myself, I would choose to avoid that part, right? I don't want to participate in sufferings. But friends, let me, let me encourage you today. There is no resurrection without death. There's no saving if there is no sin. And there's no transformation if there's nothing in your life that needs to be changed. If you want a God that can transform your life, let me introduce you to the person of Jesus Christ. Not the American Jesus, not this political Jesus, not this desperate boyfriend Jesus, but the Jesus Christ who died on a cross, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Alpha and Omega worthy lamb. That is the Jesus who can actually transform your life, who has radical power to raise you from the dead. It's not yourself, I promise you. And giving your life to him will be the best decision you ever make. We're going to go to desire number two now. We can throw that up on the screen. It's to gain Christ. Desire number two, to gain Christ. 
Okay? Now, um, we're, we have just talked about uh, the resurrection and the sufferings, and we have to gain both. But some more encouragement. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And that's the good news of the gospel is, yes, we have to share in his sufferings, but we are promised that because we are children of God, we get to share in his glory. And that's amazing. That's incredible. You know, the, the title of my talk, if you remember, is Rip Up Your Resume. And right here I've got uh, my own. It's got some good things. My, my education, my community service. Oh, okay, nice. Uh, my internships. But it's also got some things that I'm not too proud of, right? Sins listed here that I'd probably be too embarrassed to read in front of all of you here. But here's what I want you to get. When God, when we do what Paul says, and we gain Christ, God takes our resume. And he rips it up. And it's done. It's over. We don't have to worry about it anymore. It's all gone. It does not matter anymore. And I'll just, I'll just say it right out. I get it. There's no manly way to throw pieces of paper up in the air. I, I get it. Just let it go. It's out there. Okay. So what, what, what happens when we rip up our resume? You know, we, we don't have one anymore. So what does that mean for us? Well, we actually get the resume of Jesus. And this one might not look like the resumes we're used to either. It probably doesn't have the fame or the wealth or the, the things that we're used to having on ours. But I was trying to think, okay, what would the resume of Jesus Christ actually look like? And we could go back and forth on this, but I think there are three things we can totally agree on. Let's go through these one at a time. First, the Jesus Christ resume, he's a child of God. He's a child of God. We'll go through these quick. Number two, he is blameless and righteous. He's the only one to have never sinned, right? So he is righteous and blameless. And number three, he has victory over death. He has victory over death. And the crazy thing is, is that we get this resume. We get that. When we rip ours up, we get handed this resume that says, yeah, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. That's my dad. He's the best. I'm righteous and blameless now. My sin's been forgiven. It's over. Right? I have victory over death. I actually will resurrect one day and join God in the kingdom. But it's not because of anything I've done. It's because of the one who gave it to me. Right? Nothing I did attained any of this. It didn't get any of this. It's all because of the one who did it for me. And I don't know about you, but when I put that in the light of eternity and compare it to the things of this world, you know what, I would probably agree with Paul. It's all a loss in comparison to those things. I'll take that over any resume you can show me any day. I hope you do too. We're going to end with our, our final desire uh, is to be found in Christ. And this is what we were just talking about, right? When, when God sees us now, he sees us with a, with a scarlet lens covering us with the blood of Jesus. He can see us now and say, yeah, you are my son. You are my daughter. You are blameless. There's no sin in you. It's been, it's been covered. It's been taken care of. You have victory over death. Come join me in my kingdom. I have a table for you. It's ready. There's a seat for you there. We get to gain Christ and then be found in him by his heavenly father. What amazing news is that? This is what Paul talks about in the final few verses, this idea of the righteousness of of Christ. He says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So Paul's describing here this process of sanctification, okay? And that's just a fancy word that describes the process when the Holy Spirit partners with us in order to transform our lives, right? To sanctify us, to clean us. And no one will ever receive full sanctification while on this earth. Until we leave this earth, that process will never be done. But when we arrive in heaven, we will be completely sanctified. And that's what Paul's saying. He says, I haven't attained it already. I, I haven't gotten this yet. I haven't been perfect yet. But... I press on to obtain what Christ Jesus has already obtained 
for me. And friends, that is my final point. We press on because the work has already been finished. It has already been obtained. When Christ Jesus came down to die on that cross, he said, it is finished. There is nothing else we need to do. It is finished work. You cannot add to it. You cannot take away from it. And if you're deciding that, oh, well, I don't want to hurt Jesus anymore. Like, he's, he's suffered enough. I don't need to believe in him, right? You're not doing anything. If it's finished, then the work has already been done for you. He has suffered for you already. You cannot take that away. It would be foolish to leave it. It would be foolish to leave the gift of eternal life. All you have to do is receive the simplest thing. The simplest thing. When Jesus Christ came down, he died the death that you and I deserved, and he gave us the righteousness that he deserved. Totally backwards, right? He dies the death that we deserved, that I deserved, and he gave me the righteousness, gave you the righteousness that he deserved. All so that we could be co-heirs with him in the kingdom. Amazing. So friends, if you're going to listen to one thing that I say today, please have it be this. Do not let the work on the cross be done in vain. Do not let the work on the cross be done in vain. If it's already been finished, then that's great news for you. Receive it. Receive it. And if that's a decision you want to make today, man, talk to me after this service. Talk to Pastor Tom after this service. Talk to any of the leaders here. We would love to help walk you through that. But it is the best decision you will ever make. So do till church, I encourage you, rip up your resume. Get rid of it. It doesn't matter anymore. Why? Because now we can know Christ, gain Christ, gain his resume, and then we are found in Christ by God. Amen.